getting there. Anyways, thank you for having us, and I want to definitely echo the, the, uh, what the other missionaries have said. We have appreciated being here very much. We appreciate your hospitality, and uh, just, just appreciate being at a place where the Word of God is preached, where you want the Word of God to go forth. Uh, I tell you what, I love the singing. I love the, that, and that prepares our heart for some things. And sometimes after some good singing, I'm like, man, what else can I say? But it's all to exalt who? Jesus Christ. Amen. He gave us some things to do while we're here. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 14 is where we're going to be at. And, and I love... Looking at the Old Testament and, and, you know, there's a lot of pictures in the Old Testament and I understand doctrinally there's some things different doctrinally and stuff, but there is a lot of pictures in that Old Testament that we can apply to things in our lives and, and things that God wants us to do. And that's what we're going to be looking at here in 1 Samuel chapter 14, talking about Jonathan and, and some things that he did. And I want to read the first two verses and then I, I'll pray and just I want to give you a little bit of the background of what's going on just to try to, I think, paint the picture of this. But 1 Samuel chapter 14 verse 1 and 2. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. Let's pray and then we'll get started with preaching. Father, I do pray and I ask you to bless this time as we bring forth the Word of God. I pray and I ask that the Word of God would have its way in our hearts. Help us to see what, what is our responsibility. Help us to see what we should do. And I pray and I ask that most of all, Jesus, you would be glorified and honored. You would be shown forth. And that you just use me as your mouthpiece at this time. And I will thank you for it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and we ask. Amen. Amen. I want to give you the, the scenario of what's going on here. And many of you know who Saul is. Saul was the first king of Israel that the people of Israel chose. Uh, they didn't want God to rule over them anymore. They wanted a king. They wanted to be like all the other nations. When we look at Israel, I want us to realize something. Israel in the Old Testament is a picture of the church and the Christian. The Israel was supposed to be different than all the other nations around them. Why? Because they were supposed to show the nations around them that their God was truly God. Amen. That's what Israel was supposed to do. When you look at their commands and all that stuff, they were to be different for that simple reason. Their God wanted to show the world that he was truly God. Well, that same God is our God. That's the same God we serve. Right. There's some doctrine that's different back then from there. Yes, we don't do the sacrifices and all that. But there's some things that we, we are supposed to still be different, are we not, than the people around us? Are we not supposed to show the people in this world about our God, about Jesus Christ, that He is the only way, that He is the way, the truth, and the life? Amen. We are to be showing Him to this world, are we not? And that's what Israel was supposed to be doing. But what had happened was they had forgotten their God. And their God had allowed the enemy to come into their land. And their enemy is in their land and messing some things up. And I'd love to tell you the church is not letting that happen today. But you know as well as I do. I don't know that's happened at this church. But I've been at churches. We have been at churches all over this country. And you know what we're seeing? Churches where they are not doing what God wants them to do. They are not showing the light of this world, Jesus Christ, to others. And the devil was in their territory. And what I want to look at here is I believe the theme of this mission, of this missions conference is growing a world vision. Well, I want us to see some men here and some men that made a difference. And I believe that we can make a difference. Amen. 
in our church, in our community. I believe that we can make a difference if we will allow God to use us. And let's look at this and see the difference. And I, I just read, read the first two. We're going to go down through this chapter. We're not going to do every verse in the chapter, okay? But we're going to go through and highlight some things in this chapter of Saul and Jonathan and some things that I believe are applicable to our lives and some things that we should put in our lives and some ways that we should live. And, and let me, let's go ahead, keep your finger here. We'll do a little bit of turning. But go to Romans chapter 13 verse 11 to 14 says this Romans 13 chapter 13 verse 11 as we'll do 11 and 12 and that knowing and that knowing the time that it is na that now not later now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Right. But what did he say? Did he say now or did he say later? He said now is the time to awake. Now it is high time to awake out of sleep. You ever think about this? Any of you, you guys, I know when I got right with the Lord. I got saved around the age of 11, 94 is when I got right with the Lord, surrendered to serve Him whatever way. I mean, I was looking for Jesus Christ to come back that year. I'm still looking for Him to come back today. Okay. But you know what? It's nearer now than it was back then, isn't it? And you guys remember when you first got saved, and man, you were just ready. It's like, Lord, yes, come on, let's go. Even tonight, I'm ready. Do we still have that anticipation? It is now. Now, it is high time to awake out of sleep. I mean, Paul was telling this to the church back then, to over 2,000, almost 2,000 years ago. 1900 years ago but you understand I mean he was telling them then it's high time to awake out of sleep why for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed it's time for us to do something let's go back here to 1st Samuel chapter 14 and I want us to see something right now there's a difference between Saul and Jonathan here with something, and that is this in verse 1. Now it came to, upon, came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. You know why he didn't tell his father? You know what his father was doing? His father was sitting down under a tree. Yeah, man, I'm just enjoying myself. That's what Saul was doing. Look there at the next verse. Saul, who was to be the leader, who was to be the person that should be leading the battle, you know what he was doing? He had 600 men with him. You know what he's doing? He's sitting down and doing nothing. He's sitting there and doing nothing. He's tarrying. He's just waiting. You know, what Saul, you know what Jonathan said? And this isn't a thing where they were going out to conquer new land. This is the enemy is in their territory. The enemy is at them. And all that Saul is doing is sitting there doing nothing. Jonathan, a young man. And you notice, if you ever look, check out Jonathan, nothing bad is ever said about Jonathan. Jonathan said, I'm not going to sit here and do nothing. Jonathan said, I'm going to do something. And I'm going to be in this battle. You know what? You have a choice in your life. And I'd love to tell you, you are not in a battle as a Christian. But anybody who has been saved knows you are in a battle. Right. The devil does not like you. You are in his world right now. God is allowing it. And you are in his territory. Our home is in heaven. That's where our blessings, that's where our things are. But guess what? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. We don't have to give up. Jonathan didn't give up. Jonathan said, I'm not going to stay here and do nothing. I'm going to go and try to do something. And that's what Jonathan did. Keep going down through here. 
Look here in verse 6. We go down to verses, the other verses say where he was, but verse 6. They go, they, they go to the Philistines' garrison, and remember, there was somebody with him. There was a young man that bare his armor. There was somebody with him, an armor bearer. Okay? Verse 6, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. You know, sometimes we think that we have to have a lot to be used of God. Sometimes we think that, oh, if we can't do much, we can't be used. Well, that's a lie from the devil. You ever think about it? Look this up again. Just make sure I got the right number. Remember the one who, uh, the young man that gave five loaves and two fishes to Jesus? They fed how many? Over 5,000. That was just the men. I mean, five loaves and two fishes. Come on, you know, that's really a lot. But guess what? He just did what God wanted him to do. That's right. And God blessed it. And God multiplied it. You know what Jonathan said? Jonathan said, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't care. But I know God can do something with us going. He wasn't just going to sit there and do nothing. He was willing to go and say, God can use us. And he was counting on God to use him. He wasn't counting on his strength because when you look down through here, we'll go through some more. But I want us to see, he said, it may be that the Lord will work for us. He wasn't saying, boy, I'm strong enough and I know how to beat all these guys and I can take care of this myself. No. He said, it may be that the Lord will work for us. You remember after this, and I'm, I'm not jumping ahead, but I want us to think about something. You're, anybody remember David and Goliath? Everybody remembers David and Goliath. You know why right after David and Goliath, after David defeated Goliath, David went and saw Jonathan? You know what it said about Jonathan and David? It said that their souls were knit together. You know what both of them did? Both of them stood against giants. Against un uncomprehensible thing, things that you couldn't do yourself. And you know who they were both trusting in? The Lord. Both of them were boasting that the Lord could do something with them even though they had no power in themselves. And you know what God wants for us? God wants us to just make ourselves available to be used by Him. Amen. Not try to count on our strength. We count on our strength. You know what's going to happen? We're going to fail. Because it's not about us. It's about Him. Let's go down through here some more. And we're at verse 6. It says that it may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And go ahead. I want you to turn to one other thing here quick. 1 Corinthians 1.26. Keep your hand there. Keep your hand there. I don't want to give you a scripture about, you know, because there's another verse that comes to mind about the Lord hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Yep. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 1 and see something else he says about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 26. He says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. He's talking about men that are supposed to be wise in this world, okay? Not many wise men after the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. When God uses somebody that the world looks at and says, there's no way God can do something with him or with them. There's no way. 
they'll look at somebody and say, you can't do a thing for God. You know what God will say? If he wants to be used, I'll use him. And you know who gets the glory for that? God. That's what God wants. And that's why I say, sometimes I believe the devil tries to tell us, oh, that, that thing that you want to do, that's nothing. Don't even worry. But it ain't going to help at all. You know, it's not about the size of things. It's about the willingness. And when I say that, sometimes it's just a little word sometimes saying things. I'm reminded of a man that, and I, I just say this as it comes to mind, there was a man I had witnessed to for years. Known him for years, witnessed to him. He had been witnessed to plenty of times before me. He's getting ready to have some heart surgery the next day. He's had it before. But I just called him up quick. I said, well, let you know I'm praying for you. And we got talking a little bit. It wasn't long, but just, you know, I said, you know, I said, it's just simple. You know you're a sinner. I said, you know what you've done. I said, but you've got to call upon him, upon Jesus Christ to be your Savior. So it's that simple. And you know when you die, it's heaven or hell. I, I mean, I was just flat out plain to him because he's heard it all before. And you know what? I got off the phone with him. He wasn't ready to get saved at that minute. But he was with somebody that was saved. About 20 minutes afterwards, he ended up getting saved. You know what it was? It's just a little, sometimes it's just that little reminder of, hey, you know, if you call on Jesus, he'll save you. Sometimes it's just those little things that we think don't mean a thing at all. You know what? God can use them. These tracks. I tell you what, I love tracks. I love them. One other testimony quick of a guy that I got to talk to and witness to and he wasn't ready to get saved, but he saw the change. You know, I gave him a track, took it home, laid it on his, laid it on his dresser. A year went by and nothing. A year later, he had some problems going on in his life. That track was still on that dresser. Read it and got saved. I didn't even know about this till about two years after this. He saw me in a restaurant. He said, hey, Doug, you guess, guess what happened? You know what? Sometimes we think those little things don't mean a thing. But you never know what God's going to do with those little things. And that's why I say, don't let the devil think. Get in your mind. All those little things don't matter. Yes, they do. Those little things can mean all the difference in the world. You know what Jonathan said? Jonathan said, it's only two of us, but we're going to go and we're going to see what God does. It's interesting. You know what Saul? Saul had 600 men with him. But he did nothing. There's many churches that we've been to, and I just say this honestly, that with missions, you know, you look at them, you're like, man, they ought to be able to do this so much. And surprising to say, a lot of times your bigger churches aren't doing things with missions. They're too worried about what they have and keeping what they have. Don't ever get to that point. Sometimes churches think, well, we're just a small church. We can't do that much. Don't ever think you're a small church and can't do much. Little is much when God is in it. That's a song, and that's just so true. John, Jonathan said, we're not going to sit here. We're going to go and we're going to do something. So he went. He was counting on the Lord. He was counting on the Lord's strength. And you know what else is interesting to me? All through this, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 14. All through this, you don't find the armor bearer's name mentioned. You don't find his name mentioned at all. But you know what you find? He's with them. Go to 1 Samuel 14, 7. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. You know what Jonathan had? Jonathan had somebody there helping him. That armor bearer didn't have any name. That armor bearer was that nameless person who was back there praying for the missionaries. Back there praying for the pastor. It was back in the background that nobody ever sees. But you know what he does? He encourages the man of God. He encourages the person who is faithful. He makes sure that he's there with 
them. He doesn't want recognition. He doesn't want to be known. He's just like, I'm there with you, brother. Do what God wants you to do, and I'm here with you. You know what? Every man of God needs somebody like that. Every man of God. The pastor here, the people who are in charge, they need somebody as an armor bearer. Go ahead and turn. Keep your finger here because we'll go back. But I love turning to some of this stuff because I don't want you just thinking it's what I say. Psalms 133. David talks about this too in Psalms 133 verse 1. says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. You know, it's talking about that oil that they anointed Aaron with when he was priest. You know why? He's talking about dwelling together in unity. I'm not talking at the price of doctrine. Don't get me wrong when I say that. But there are sometimes just some little preferences that really are not that big of a thing. We've seen it at churches. I'm sure you have known of churches where it gets in. And you know what it does? It causes division. And you know what happens to the church? The lights go out. The power goes down. There is no power in a church where there is division. And you know why? Because there is plenty of division out there in the world, fighting, fussing, arguing over foolish things. They come to a church and hear that and see that, guess what? What's any different in here than out there? Be careful of that. I just say that honestly. As we've been around the churches, we have seen it more and more. We've seen churches that are recovering from it. So don't get me wrong. But brethren, it is good to dwell together in unity. With this, um, in 1 Samuel 14, there again, that armor bearer was, man, do whatever you want as far as according to your heart. I am with you. I'm with you. There was unity there. Go down here to the next verse. Verse 8. Keep going down through here. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say un thus unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still on our place, and will not go up to, uh, unto them. But if they say thus, Come up unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hands, and this shall be for a sign unto us. You know what he did? He included the Lord in it. He didn't just go over there and say, I'm going to do what I want. We see he was already counting on the Lord's strength. Yes, but he was also trusting in the Lord's direction. I mean, the Israelites were told to look for signs. Yes, we aren't told to look for signs. We're told we are given the Holy Spirit. We are given the Word of God. There are some things that are different. But either way, who are we to go? Who are we to let direct us? The Lord. Not ourselves. Not just what we want. It's supposed to be what the Lord wants. And we're supposed to let Him direct us. And that's what they did. Jonathan was not content to just sit there and do nothing. He was going to go over and see what the Lord would have him to do. He had his armor bearer with him. He had somebody there to help him. And they were counting on the Lord's strength. There was unity. He got over there and he didn't just say, okay, we're here. I'm doing what I want now. No, he got over there and he said, Lord, what is it you want me to do? And I will do it. And you know, that's where we all need to come to. We need to be willing to go. Yes. It's good to have help. We all need help. But we also need to make sure we are letting the Lord direct our steps. And go where He wants us to go. Not just where we want to go. I'm reminded of Peter. And John, it's John 21. I'm not going to turn to it, but after 
they knew Jesus Christ had resurrected. And they were out there fishing. And again, they fished all night. They didn't catch any fishes. Jesus appeared to them on the shore the next morning. And they said, have you any meat? They said, no. And he said, cast your net on the right side of the ship the right place and you know what they did and they had you know what Peter John said Peter that's the Lord Peter just jumped out of the boat swam on over and went to the Lord they had fellowship and Jesus looked at Peter afterwards and he said Peter and that's when he said do you love me three times he asked him that but then afterwards you know what he said to Peter he said Peter and I, I'm paraphrasing because I don't have, but he said this to Peter. He looked at Peter. He said, Peter, when you get older, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. But follow me. Peter looked around. He saw John. He said, Jesus, what about John? You know what Jesus said to Peter? He said, Peter, don't you worry about John. He said, you follow me. You know what sometimes we do? We get looking around at other people. We get looking around at what other people are doing. Oh boy, that's a good thing. Look at the, look at the results he's having. And boy, I want them results. So we just start doing what that person does. Well, then it doesn't start working for us. Well, oh, look at what that person's doing. Boy, boy, they're getting a lot of people at their church. We ought to go the way they are. We're going to do that. And you know what we never do? We never find out what God wants us to do. We need to find out what God wants us to do. There's plenty of programs you can try to get, but that doesn't mean it's what God wants you to do. You know what you need to do? Find out what God wants you to do. He asked for direction. God gave him direction. And the last verse that we're going to look at with this, but I believe it's so important. Verse... Verse 11. Or, or go, I'm sorry, go down to verse 13. He discovered himself. They said, come on up. And he said, hey, God's delivered us. And then look at, or delivered them into our hands. Look at verse 13. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet. And his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan. And his armor bearer slew after him. You know what? They were both needed. Both of them were necessary. You had Jonathan out here, and I mean, he's fighting and he's knocking them down. But guess what? The armor's bearer behind him. Armor bearer, you know, as he knocks them down, reverse. Mm, mm. You know what he's doing? He's making sure they don't get back up. You know what? Jonathan's fighting here. The armor bearer is back here. And you know what? The armor bearer has his back. They're watching out for each other. And you know what they're doing? They're doing the jobs they're supposed to do. You remember what Christ likened the church to in Romans? He likens it to a body. Let me ask you this. Does every part in the body have the same job? No. Is every part on the body a mouth? Boy, we'd be pretty, pretty loud people, wouldn't we? Is every part a foot? Is every part an eye? Is every part an ear? No. They all have their different jobs to do. But what happens when one of them doesn't do what they're supposed to do? Then the body doesn't work the way it's supposed to, does it? We can try to say, we want to be this. But what is it that God wants us to be? Both these men were doing what they were supposed to do. They weren't in it for their glory. They weren't in it for their honor. You know what I believe the best one was? To me, I say the most important was the armor bearer one. Because you know what? If he would not have been having his back, you know what happens when somebody... You're fighting all these people up here. You can't look behind you. Somebody got to be there to help you. Somebody got to be there to support you. That's what that armor bearer was. I believe many times in churches, people think they're not important because they're not recognized. You are important. You are very important. You know what? Can you see your heart? No. But is your heart important? Extremely important. Can you see your lungs? They don't look too good if you do. 
No, but they are extremely important. It's the same in the church. The things you see on the outside, the ones of us you see, guess what? You can do without us, honestly. But it's where God put us. And that's why we're doing it. He made us who we are. But He has a job for you to do. Don't think you're not important. You are. And just like these two men, Jonathan and his armor bearer, they listened to God. They weren't content to just sit there and do nothing. They wanted to do something for the Lord. They went out. They did it. They were trusting on God's strength, God's direction. And they were fighting together against the enemy. Not fighting each other, but against the enemy. And God used them in a mighty way. Amen. And I want us to look at the results because to me, this is an encouragement that, you know what? God would use men. I, I'm still amazed. When I look at myself, and I'm like, God, you would choose to use me? I just know who I am. I know where I came from. And God would choose to use me? I'm like, it's a privilege, man. It's an honor. Yeah. And you know what? God wants to use you. In whatever way. And you know what? I'll say this. To me, it's a big responsibility for this reason. The people who support us, missionaries, the people who support the pastor, you know what you do? You entrust us with some things that you can't do. Because you can't be in Romania. You can't be every place where we are. But you are entrusting us to be your representatives, to preach the gospel, and to show them. And it's a responsibility we have, but we do it to please Him. And when things are done the way God wants, go here to 1 Samuel 14, verse 20. We'll start at with verse 20. It says this, And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves, and they came to the battle. Behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was a very great discomfiture. What happened was Saul and them heard, Hey, God, there's something going on over there. Boy, there's some things happening. Boy, God is moving at that place. Boy, let's go see what's happening. And they came over, Saul and the 600 men. And it's still just Saul and Jonathan there, or Jonathan and his armor bearer. But you know what they're doing? They're winning the victory. They're winning the battle. And Saul and them are like, man, God's here and God's moving. And they get involved. And they start doing something. And God starts using them. Verse 21, moreover, the Hebrews, Hebrews were a type of, they were the children of God at that time, that were with the Philistines before that time which went up with them into the camp from the country round about. Even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise also the men of Israel which had hid themselves in the Mount Ephraim. When they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day and the battle passed over unto beth -Avon. But because, because Jonathan and his armor bearer were faithful, you know what happened? Other people got involved in the battle. Other people started getting, letting God use them. The men, the, the Hebrews that were with the enemy, guess what? They stopped being with the enemy. The ones who were hiding, you know, the Christians who don't want to be known as Christians, you know? You understand what I'm saying. There are people out there like that. Guess what? Yeah, maybe there is something. Maybe I really ought to start living right. Maybe I really ought to start doing what God wants me to do. They stopped hiding. And they came out of hiding. You know, if you would do what God wants you to do, you never know what God could use you for. That's right. In all honesty, as I said, there's so many types in here, but my question for you is this. When we look at this story, you had Saul who was sitting down doing nothing. 
You had Jonathan who said, I'm, not, I'm tired of doing nothing. I'm going to do something for the Lord. You had the armor bearer who said, that's right, Jonathan, I'm with you. And then you had the Hebrews who were hiding and didn't want to be known as Christians. And you had the enemy. There are so many ones in this story. But my question for you is this. Which one are you in this story? Are you a person that you know God wants you to do something? And you're like, well, I can't do much so it ain't worth it. Are you a person that you know God wants you to do And you're just like, I'm just too busy with doing things. I, I'm too busy to do it. I can't put aside what I want. I'm going to do what I want instead of what God wants. Or are you a man or a woman that knows that God wants you to do something? You're going to say, you know what, God? I don't care. I'm going to do something for you. And are you going to decide that, you know what? I'm done living my life for myself. I want to do something for you and I want to stand for you. Yeah. Though nobody else will be with you. You may have one person with you and you know who's with you all the time? Jesus Christ. That Holy Spirit is in you. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And he will give you strength. And he will give you the grace. And he will give you what you need to stand for him. And you know what? When you start standing, you can make a difference. And you know what? Sometimes when you start standing, you know what will happen? Some people will come along. Boy, man, maybe there is something to what he's talking about. You might get somebody saved. Maybe you might just encourage a Christian who's been hiding and says, you know what? I need to stop hiding. I need to start being a Christian and start living the way that I should. You know, all this happened because what? Because one man decided to make a stand. My question is, what about you? What will you decide to do with your life? Remember Paul's end, 1 Timothy 4, verses uh, 7 and 8. He said, about the time of my departure is hand, and I am now ready to be offered. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. I have fought a good fight. And he said this, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and not to me only, but also to all them that love his appearing. You know what? Are you ready to see Jesus Christ? That's a simple question. Are you ready to see Jesus Christ? Because it could happen today. You know what? Jonathan did his best. And God honored it. He stood for God. And God used him. Though we might not see physical things, we can have spiritual blessings. We can have a grace and a peace that nobody can give, give us other than Him. But you know what He wants us to do? He wants us to stand. He wants us to say, God, I'm going to live for you, and I'm going to do what you want, and I'm going to stop living for myself. I'm going to do what you want. You know what? That's what He's looking for. You know that motto of the Marines? We're looking for a few good men. Jesus Christ is looking for a few good men or women that will stand for him. My question is, what are you going to do? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, I do thank you for your grace and mercy, love and your kindness. We do thank you for your word and we thank you for the promises in it. We thank you that we can count on you to be there for us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us, but you will be there. And when we stand for you, we won't stand alone. You'll stand with us. Oh, we thank you for that. I pray and I ask you would search hearts now. Help us, myself included, to determine as Christians that we will stand for you. We will get our direction from you. And we will do what you want. And we'll thank you for it. I ask if anybody here is unsaved, that they would realize their need to trust you, Jesus Christ, you and you alone, 
as their Savior to get them to heaven. And we'll thank you. I ask you to keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. And it's this simple. If God's dealing with your heart, He wants you to speak to Him. He wants you to just get things right with Him. It doesn't have to be, it, it doesn't have to be all the tears involved, but it does have to involve your heart. If God has pricked your heart to let you know you need to stand for Him and He wants you to do something or, or live for Him, whatever it is, you can either talk to Him there or you can come to this altar and talk to Him, whichever you want. But I implore you, talk to Him. Because as He's working in your heart now, you know what's going to happen when you go out that door? The world's going to start working on your heart. And trying to dull that sound, trying to dull the spirits that's leading you. And if he's pricking your heart about something, you need to talk to him. Admit to him that you want to live for him. If you're unsaved, if you never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you know what? We can show you real quickly out of the Bible that Jesus Christ is the way to heaven and he'll accept you. But you have to ask him. I'm going to just close in a word of prayer, but I'm going to turn it over to the pastor with that. Father, we again ask you with direct steps. I ask you to help us to just do what you want, to live the way that you want. And if you've spoken to our hearts, may we move and act on it. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray and I ask. Amen.